So some tough markets in the in, in, in tough market environment in the, in the early 70s. You, you came out with the, a, a really impactful and revolutionary and controversial article in 1975 called The Loser's Game, uh, which was inspired by a, a, a book on tennis. Can you talk about um, what went into that article and the reaction to it? Yeah, let me talk a little bit about the book because it's really worth celebrating. Simon Ramo was a fabulously wonderful human being on a lot of different levels. People liked him a lot. He was also the Ramo of Thompson Ramo Woldridge, or TRW, which is the organization that did almost all the general contracting for the American Space Program. So you could argue sensibly that he, more than any other American, made an enormous impact on the space program, which was an exciting, extraordinarily powerful, mm -hmm. and very substantial impact in economics and in society and the way we think about ourselves. So, great industrialist, inspiring leader. He also happened to be a gifted musician. He and three members of the Los Angeles Symphony Orchestra played in concert as a quartet. Uh, and he happened to be a pretty good athlete. And he, being trained as an engineer, looked on tennis in a way that nobody had ever looked at tennis before. And he realized there are two games of tennis and they use the same equipment, the same court, the same dress code, and they keep score the same way. But other than that, they're completely different. In professional tennis or expert tennis, and there are very few people that really play expert tennis, but there are people, and we've all seen them when you see the Williams sisters or mm -hmm. some of the others. They are really good, and they don't make mistakes, but they force the other person to do just a little bit harder to do, a little bit harder to do, and sooner or later, a forced error is made. Uh, and they win points most of the time. I don't know about you, but I do know about me. When I play tennis, I play for fun. And I lose points. And I, uh, I hit it in the net. The really good players never hit it in the net. I double fault. Good players almost never double fault. I hit it out of the court. They don't hit it out of the court. They get close to the line, but they don't hit it. And I give you layup after layup after layup, easy shots you can put away. So he said, you know, you have to understand which game of tennis you're playing. And if you're a brilliant athlete, fabulous tennis player, you should play a winning strategy. But if you're not, you should play to not lose. You should be defensive, keep the ball in play. My father-in-law is a terrific athlete. So if you get the ball back three times on every point, you win every match for the rest of your life. And he was right. So loser tennis is what I play. Uh, the Williams sisters play winning tennis. And once you get that in your mind, it's hard to shake, and you'll see it showing up in one place after another after another. Driving, for example, is don't make mistakes, don't have accidents, don't do anything that's dangerous, and you'll be fine. Uh, if you want to be a fabulous Indianapolis 500 driver, that's your choice. But that's a different line of work. Uh, investment management. Uh, there are people who are playing a winner's game. And they are doing something that is so beautifully done that you and I would be very confident they'll keep it up. And then there are a lot of people who are in there competing as best they can, but um, candidly, they make mistakes. They buy high and sell low, and they have their portfolio arranged the wrong way. And sooner or later, they fall short of what they're trying to do. And because I was working with a large number of different investment management firms, I could see for myself, they're all the same in s s such ways as you know, really bright people who have really studied investment management and know a lot about how to do it and how to think about it. They are very good at networking with other people and gathering information. They've got access to terrific information resources, and they are excited about the information they've got. Uh, they've got computing power that's terrific. And they're all competing with each other, and they don't realize it's not the market that they're competing with. It's those other guys. And those other guys are pretty good, and it's pretty hard to beat them. And that was the genesis of realizing what Ramos talking about in tennis applies to investment management. And uh, the name of the article, which 
the thesis was how to not lose is realize mistakes are terribly important. Mm -hmm. Try to avoid mistakes and call the article the loser's game because the game is dominated not by the winner but by the loser. So what was the reaction in the investment profession when this? Well, everybody came? I knew is, was close thought, you're going to have a tough reaction. A lot of people are going to be angry. No, not a chance. They all thought, yeah, this is, that's cute. Of course, it doesn't apply to me, but yeah, it applies to a lot of these other guys, but not <laughs> to me. I mean, I'm really doing well. So, so then that became the impetus for, for the book that, that uh, it eventually morphed into uh, winning the loser's game. Uh, and uh, you provide some uh, important insights. And, and one of the big takeaways from it uh, is that uh, uh, you say winning the loser's game of beating the market is easy. Don't play it. So can you expand on that and, and other insights in terms of the book? Well, give you just current information. If you said, I would like to be in the top 25%, top quartile of investment results with my investment manager, I can say to you comfortably, you can do that easily. Uh, well, actually, top 25% is fine, but I'd like to actually be in the top 15%. Can you do that? Yep. I can guarantee you that you'll be in the top 15%. Top 5%? No, I can't guarantee that. Top 15%. Guaranteed? Yeah. Over 15 or 20 year period, you'll be in the top 15% if you follow my simple guideline. Gee, that sounds like a winning proposition. It is. What do you do? You invest in a low cost index fund and relax because it's going to happen. And the reason for that is really something that's important. And let me just take a minute sure, to give you yeah. some of the mechanics. Back in a day, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, less than 10% of trading on the New York Stock Exchange was done by institutions. And those institutions, candidly, were mostly regional trust departments that bought blue chip stocks to hold forever and had an investment committee that chose which ones would be on the approved list and then younger guys would implement them. This was not an aggressive group of institutions. So you've gone from 9 or 10 percent institutional, and I put that in quotes, mm -hmm. up to now 98, 99 percent institutional. And those institutions are enormously aggressive, intensive, well-armed, well-staffed, wonderfully com competitive people. Uh, when you get to the point where I could buy and sell nine out of ten times from an amateur who's not involved in the market at all and doesn't honestly know what's really going on, that's one thing. When you step up and you say, anytime I want to buy a stock, I've got to buy it from those, a guy who knows exactly what I know. And it's just a matter of my judgment on those facts versus his judgment on those facts. That's hard. Now, if you want to sell that stock, you've got to sell it to the same kind of person. 50% of the trading is done by either compute machines, computers, or by the largest institutions in terms of volume of activity, and half of them are hedge funds. These are very rational, hard-hitting, aggressive, and it's hard for anybody who hasn't seen it up close how aggressive, aggressive is, but they are constantly striving little micro advantages all the time all got the same tools, all got the same equipment, they've all got the same information, and you're going to buy and sell from those guys, and all you have to do to keep up with the market is earn back your fees, and let's call that 1% of assets, mm -hmm. plus your cost of operation. That's either 1% of assets or 2% of assets, depending on how you want to calculate it. Let's say it's just 1%, so that's mm -hmm. 1 plus 1 is 2, and you've got to earn that back. In what kind of a market? Well. Consensus seems to be somewhere between a 6 or 7% return expectation over the next decade. Okay, so let's say 6% just for convenience. 6%, 2%, holy smokes, I have to do 30%, 33% better than the competition just to break even. Mm -hmm. Just to keep up with the market, I've got to beat the competition by 33%. Who that Dickens is going to be able to do that? Who among us is going to be able to do that? 
Well, there are some people who think they can, but they're very, very few. And to think that I'm going to find a manager who's going to be able to do that. So it's one thing to look backwards to say a few have, but it's another thing to try and pick those in advance. That'd be one. The second thing is, let's say we found one. If you could produce 33% rates of return, why wouldn't you just manage your own money? Why do you <laughs> want to have the burden of carrying my money around with you? <laughs> so that's a very real problem. And as you know, there have been star managers who've closed down and said, I can do better for my family managing the money on my own than not having to carry all that public money. <laughs> so it's a major, major change in the world. And what's amazing to me is that we really have stayed with the mythology rather than recognizing the realities underneath it. And the realities are profound and they are powerful and uh, they're unrelenting. There's no way that we're gonna go back to a time when, oh yeah, let's all go down and beat the market. It just isn't gonna happen.